acceptable result for them. So I don't think they were too dejected about it, but I don't think they were thrilled either. I think the fact that they didn't give up an away goal is is pretty key. Uh, they did that e- even when they had the 4-1 victory in the first leg against NYCFC. There was still some concern on their end because they gave up that away goal and it created some interesting scenarios. But now they go into Toronto thinking that if they can get an early goal, um, it completely changes the complexion of the series. Now, that's way easier said than done uh, when you're talking about a team that gave up the second fewest goals in MLS this season in Toronto. But um, if they can find a way to break down that defense and, and get an early goal um, or even get a goal to tie at 1-1, I think they feel like they're in pretty good shape. So, um, you know, obviously when you're playing at home in front of a sold-out crowd to not get um, a goal and, and you know, mm-hmm. knowing that in the last home playoff game they had four, um, I think there's a sense of disappointment there. But um, I, I think at the end of the day, they're not necessarily in panic mode. No, absolutely. And that crowd, Andrew, me and Steven saw it from afar, but how was that crowd? I mean, they, the, the community has rallied around the crew, especially ever since Anthony Precourt has announced his potential intentions to move the team. So how was how, how was that crowd? It, it was a perfectly, uh, I guess, I guess they had enough time to uh, figure out if they wanted to go to the game or not. So uh, what was the atmosphere like in that map free stadium? Yeah, it, it was, you know, 21,000 plus to sell out um, easily the best crowd I, I've seen since I've been on the beat, you know, and that's been about 11 and a half months. So, um, you know, certainly if, if you're the fan base and you're hoping to show that there's pride in this team and, and you want to create that home atmosphere um, for a team in the playoffs, I think this was it. People were loud, um, chanting throughout the game, and I think yeah. gave the team a bit of a lift. Um, you know, I'm sure some disappointment, you know, like like there was for the players, some disappointment from the fans. Uh, that the, the team was not able to get a goal, but I think this uh, was intimidating and, and was uh, MLS playoff esque. So I think I think they did what they set out to do in that sense. Now on the field, Toronto will be getting Altidore and Giovinco back. How will, how do you expect Columbus to set up to to deal with you know those two coming back? You know, I don't expect their formation to change at all. I think their awareness is heightened, obviously, in the box. You have guys like um, Giovinco and Altador that are a little bit more technically sound and can combine a little bit more in the box. Um, with a guy like Ricketts this past game, I think the concern would have been, you know, a, a long ball getting over their head and, and, and Ricketts with his speed and, and jumping ability, um, either running past the back line for a goal um, or, or jumping up to head and across for a goal. So I think the concerns are slightly different. Um, that being said, you know when you bring a guy like Giovinco in, um, you, you have to have your your awareness heightened just on on free kicks and mm. and set pieces because he's so he's so skilled in that. And because you know, frankly, if he doesn't make that free kick against the Red Bulls, um, you know, the Crew SC might be playing the New York Red Bulls right now. So yeah. you, you constantly have to be aware of things like that and. I'm not sure there's any way to prepare for it just because he's so unique in his ability there, but certainly watching film, that's something they'll have to be aware of going into this second leg. And we do know that the crew will be missing Artur, uh, their uh, their midfielder, and we know Abu is kind of a like, kind of a like for like switch, but is a loss of Artur big for the crew going into this second leg? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Just because when you look at Artur, and I think Artur has been an underrated player for them all season. Absolutely. When you look at his ground cover, when you look at his ability box to box, um, just his intelligence for a 21 year old kid making fouls in the right situations. Like if you go back and watch the play where he fouled Bradley and got that yellow card, I mean, maybe he's a little bit overly aggressive on that play, but if he misses or if he lets Bradley go by him, um, it's a three-on-two attack and maybe Toronto's best chance of the entire game. So I, I think his awareness to, to see that play unfolding and to recognize where the rest of his team is 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 key and, and something Kruessi will absolutely miss. That's not to say that Muhammad Abu hasn't played in big games. I wrote in the paper a couple days ago that you know he remembered playing in a Europa League qualifier at Atletico Madrid. So it's a guy that's played in some big games in his career and yeah. I don't think would be worried or nervous about the moment, but um, just in terms of, of technical ability and execution, I think Artur's a guy you'd like to have on the field. 
Now, Columbus will be I, I guess heavily underdogs, but they've kind of been like this, uh, been this the entire postseason. First off in Atlanta, then NYCFC. Do you think it suits them to be this underdog, especially going to a hostile, hostile environment like BMO Field? Yeah, I mean, I think so. And, and you know, Justin Merriman and I have kind of a running joke where every, every week I'll I'll tell him the soccer power index percentage chance that they have to advance and it'll be like you know i think this week it's 35 percent and his response is usually always oh i, I thought it was going to be even lower than that so <laughs> um you know, i think they're aware of this role and i'm sure there are a few of them that it, it bothers them in some senses they sure. feel like they felt like going into the playoffs with you know they were 10 unbeaten at the time and carried that streak to 12 that they were one of the best teams in the league and i think didn't necessarily get the recognition there so you know, I'm, I'm sure there was a, a little bit of saltiness about that, and, and rightfully so. And, and I think they're still out to prove at this point that you know they're among those contenders, even even though they're one of the last two teams standing. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, and we did see Michael Bradley make some comments that did upset the hashtag Save the Crew movement. We also did see a potential stadium plan pitch that was retracted and said as more of just like a pipe dream. What what's the update on the hashtag Save the Crew uh, situation, and what was the community's response to uh, what Michael Bradley had said uh, in this post game press conference? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think in full context and, and in, in fairness to Michael Bradley, um, what he said came after a match where he was booed on every single touch. Um, so I'm sure, even if you're a guy who's who's pretty thick skinned, that's that's going to bother you a little bit. Um, and so somebody asked him after the game what he felt about. Um, the situation and, and he gave what he felt was an honest answer. Obviously that didn't, didn't sit well with the fans. And um, I asked Greg Berhalter about it the next day and he said, you know, everybody has their opinions and we don't necessarily have to agree with it, but he's certainly entitled to his opinion. And I asked Will Trapp if this was something that could potentially be bulletin board material for the crew. And he said, could be. Um, so I, I'm sure, I'm sure that, quote and and that statement from michael bradley will probably make the rounds and and might make an appearance or two in the crew locker room that remains to be seen but um you know it was a guy stating his opinion and then in response to your second question about the stadium plan i think that was uh an effort by a a leadership member in in the columbus foundation just to get the conversation started Mm -hmm. um obviously there wasn't a whole lot of communication back and forth with the county on you know, public dollars to be used or even the Abbott lab site, which was the, the proposed site. Um, so, I mean, I, I think it's likely we'll see more of those in the coming months, but I think it was something where this is a, a city leader that wanted to get the conversation started before the playoff game. Um, even if he didn't necessarily have all of his ducks in a row. So I think, I think we'll see when it comes to Columbus stadium sites. Oh, fantastic. Well, let's wrap up with this. Um, shameless plug. So, where can we find you? And do you ex- what are your expectations for this game? Uh, you c- you can follow me um, at a Erickson CD, um, and you can read our Crew Cuts blog on the Columbus Dispatch website. Um, but you know, I, I I've, I've been trying to wrap my head around what this game will play, how this game will play out, and I'm not sure. I don't think it will be quite like the knockout round game against Atlanta United, where it was back mm. and forth the entire game, completely open both teams with, with several great and dangerous chances. I don't necessarily see it playing out like that. Um, I, I think it will be, I would be surprised if Toronto didn't score at least once in this game. Um, so I, I think it's going to come down to, can Crew SC break down, down that back line? Can they find a way um, to get Ola Kamara, you know, a, a, a one touch goal or, um, you know, find a way to, to break down that defense. I think that'll be the difference. I think Toronto will get at least one, but can the, can the crew respond, I think, is really the question. Oh, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Andrew. And uh, Thanks, Andrew. Talk to you soon, and uh, we'll get us some uh, – we'll see what happens. All right, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks for your time. What a great series that's going to shape out to be. Maybe it'll be an MLS Classic like last year's Eastern Conference Final. I hope. You better. I mean, that'd be MLS, fun to watch. I mean, the first two legs. I mean, the first two legs of both series, 
were kind of underwhelming. No, I, I, I agree. But now here we are. And I'm excited to see what's going to happen. So right, let's, let's focus on the West because last week was heavy West. So we're going to briefly mention it. Uh, Houston going into Seattle. Still have never, historically have never won in Seattle, which is, you know, absolutely amazing. But, you know, uh, they beat Portland 2-1 on the road. So they do have, you know, some momentum winning on the road. They know when that is. This is going to be an interesting matchup because the 2 all the 2-0 hole is one of those score lines that you never want to be in. My first reaction after that game was over was I thought Seattle had one and a half one foot in and half of the other foot into the MLS Cup. Yeah. Um and that's just that was my initial reaction. I mean once you look into it, I mean, yeah, Houston has the opportunity to, but I'm gonna be quite frank with you, a team like Seattle at their home, I I don't think I, I really don't think that Houston can come back and Maybe I'm being negative. I mean, I chose Houston to go to MLS Cup, so I'm a little sad they're not going. But you know, <laughs> but you know, I mean, if they don't go, but I, I, it it just doesn't seem meant to be this year. For Houston, yeah, I agree. Yeah, for Houston, I mean, for Se- I think we're gonna head to the inevitable Seattle Toronto rematch. I I do agree. Um, some interesting names missing from Seattle's perspective: Roman Torres. Double yellow cards will be on the bench. So that partnership with Chad Marshall is going to be interesting. Then we have, you know, the the goalkeeping situation. Stefan Fry, uh, his hamstring, will it be good enough to play? Uh, Houston's going to bring an onslaught, so you better have a goalkeeper who is going to be available to do what goalkeepers do and not have somebody with a tight hamstring because a tight hamstring could, could really hinder movement especially for a goalkeeper. And uh, the the Sounders, you know, one home defeat this season, a one nail loss at Toronto, May 6, including playoffs. One of the last four um, for a combined score of 12 nothing. So Seattle's hot at home. CenturyLink is a difficult place. It's a difficult place to play. Uh, my my thought process go, uh, going through the series was I really – if I was Houston, you really want to get that zero zero draw at home or a one zero win or something like that. I just I yeah. don't see them coming back in any way, shape, or form. Even though they're le- they're lethal, I don't. Th- they won't have Elise. They won't have Elise either. And he's suspended as well. It's 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 not good. Uh, you're gonna look at Manotas and Torres to and Kubo Torres to give you production. And um, Manotas started by himself, and we're us and Corey were talking about who do you think was better. I mean, they need. They need an absolute, a brilliant performance. If they win this match, I would be scared of whoever team they're playing in MLS Cup. Well, I mean, they like, could win this match one nothing. Remember, it is a well, two hole lead. Win, win the win the series. Win the series. Okay, win the, win series. the series. Yeah, uh, no, I don't. I just don't see it happening. I don't either. I think Seattle is too poised. They 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 have the momentum. Clint Dempsey's been a boss. He has shown his worth. Um, it's funny. I Clint Dempsey doesn't get the same hatred as Josie Outdoor or Michael Bradley get. It's because he, he. It's because it's Clint Dempsey. You know, coming from a Nacogdoches, Texas, two-hour drive practice every day. I think people people relate to that he's a that, lot. He's that blue but, collar, but, but, that blue collar. But back ass. to the series. How shocked would you be if Houston was able to pull out a uh, victory in the series? In the se- like before the series had started, both. But well, before the series, I thought Houston had the fair shot. They just took down Portland. They 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 historically have done well in the playoffs. They have the most conference appearances in the last, I think, decade or something. You know, higher than the LA Galaxy. They've hosted two cups, lost two cups. So the the name of the Houston Dynamo, there's historic value to it in a brief historic ten years, right? You know, you would. Um, but I thought they had a fair shot. I didn't think the first leg depended if Houston could have gotten a goal or just would. And they didn't get that red card, with Anna Baba, with the dog so did have a goal scoring opportunity. I mean, I think that just flipped the game yeah. on. No, head. it did, and and S- Seattle could have had the. 
the chance to – or Houston could have had the chance to – okay, maybe even if it was a 0-0 draw, they still would have had a chance, right? But the 0-0 they, draw almost gives an advantage to the away team because all he needs one, one goal. One goal, and then you and flip the, the game. And the home team is too. Exactly. Yep.